Way back in 1973, Maya Angelou said, you are only free when you belong no place, when you belong every place, no place at all. The price is high, she said. The reward is great. It's a little bit of a riddle, isn't it? <laughs> what does it mean? Thanks. I'm so glad you asked, Don. <laughs> Dr. Brene Brown, the author of uh, the book that we're using for this series and the class on Thursday, um, the book is called Braving the Wilderness, and she's a social scientist, so she's been studying for decades, and she's a huge fan of Maya Angelou. She's like read everything that Maya's put out there, watched all of her interviews, and this darn quote, she said, just would make her mad every time she heard it, because belonging was so important to her, and how could Maya say that we belong no place? What hope is there, you know? And so we're going to circle back to this quote a little bit later, um, and, and maybe we'll even pick it up in, in future Sundays, we'll see, because there's, there's some good meat in it. Um, but for now, let's just take a look at belonging, this idea of belonging. What is it all about to belong, to truly belong? You know, sometimes we think of belonging as fitting in, right? We kind of fit somewhere. But usually that's a cheap substitute, for belonging because the longing that we have to belong is a deeper kind of longing the longing that we have to belong is is a real true being it's an authenticity it calls calls for a kind of unique individuality oddly enough and so it is in that that we find our truest belonging is truly being who we are at our core and the full unique expression of who we are and so if we instead do what most of us or many of us has found, found us, ourselves doing over the years, certainly most of us could relate to doing this in middle school, but we probably still do it. I know I still do it. Um, and is, is that sort of pretzeling ourselves, right, to fit into something that doesn't totally fit for us. Because the idea of friendship or community is better than a feeling that we have none, right? <laughs> and so we'll find ways that we kind of give a little piece of ourselves away, or we sell a little piece out to feel that kind of sense of fitting in. But what I want to really lay out for you and what Dr. Brown lays out in this work is that true belonging is something we really don't need to give up on. The reward is great, remember, Maya Angelou said, and we're after the reward. <laughs> and there may be times when the price feels high. There's maybe times that it's difficult. That's what that wilderness that Dr. Brown is talking about, and we'll, we'll explore that as well. So as we look at this idea of belonging, one of the definitions that Brene Brown gives is that true belonging, our sense of belonging, can never be greater than the level that we have of self-acceptance. So it's not so much that the other kids, so to speak, are going to accept us. It's about our own self-acceptance. We know this, right? I'm preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> we know it, but we sort of forget, don't we? In action, in, when we're putting into implementation in life, sometimes we forget these basic premises. That when we accept ourselves fully for who we are, with all of our foibles and all of our gifts, you know, with our divine essence and our ways in which we make mistakes and, you know, have to ask for forgiveness or forgive ourselves along the way, it's all part of the journey. And the more real we get about it, the more those experiences become secondhand, you know? that we start to be accountable for our mistakes and we say we're sorry when we're sorry or, or at least apologize. I don't always like the sorry idea but because we're not sorry. But we're apologetic for things that we've said or done that didn't, didn't really play out the way that we had expected or wanted to. So on this, this journey of belonging, sometimes it is a process as it is with all of these spiritual things that we do, it seems, that we kind of have the opposite of experience, right? That makes us sort of so uncomfortable enough that, 
that we realize, ah, that's not where I belong. <laughs> so we kind of find the places we really don't belong before we can really find that sense of home. Anybody relate to that? You've had those experiences? When I was in my 20s, which is a common time that we're sort of what we call finding ourselves, right? That we're trying things on and we're sort of exploring maybe career paths or relationships or different ways of belonging in the world, families, groups, communities, a sense of, of who we are and, and ex exploring that. During that time, I had my first professional job at Ogilvy & Mather Public Relations in Chicago. It sounded on the outside like a good job, you know? It was a great start. I had studied public relations, so it seemed like the right fit. And there I was in my straight skirts and ruffled blouses and low high heels and pantyhose. Oh. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> and it just, I didn't, it didn't fit. It wasn't me, you know? It wasn't just the looks. It wasn't just the, the, the atmosphere. It was everything, you know? I just, it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me. When I got there, I wanted to go by my full name, Kristen. Up until then, I'd been called Chris. And so I got the nameplate, you know, Kristen, two eyes, no E, P, dot for Powell. But right next to me was Kristen Phillips with, you know, Kristen, two eyes, P, dot. So I got all of her mail and I got all of her phone calls and, you know, she came in, Kristen, and I was trying to change. So I said, okay, fine, I'll go back to Chris, which didn't really feel like me either, you know? It was just like, <laughs> where do I belong? So I remember sitting in an office one day and one of my bosses is giving me my assignments and it was like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but it was like I was there, but I was not there at all. It was like vacant, hello, nobody's really there. I'm, I'm in the outfit, you know? I'm sitting in the chair, I'm nodding my head. I might have even been taking notes, I don't know. And she's speaking, but it's kind of like a movie, like where it just sort of fades, you know? And it's like, I literally like felt my spirit leave my body and it was whipping around the hallways and I was just like, wow, this is a weird experience, you know? You know you don't belong when your, your spirit takes a hike, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> so, so then it, it began my quest for belonging. Where do I belong? What is my career path? What is my way of serving in the world? And I'd been reading the papers about school reform in Chicago when I was on the L train to my job and I thought, now this sounds really exciting, like it's a movement. It's something to be a part of, some kind of change agent, helping teachers learn how to teach math and science, hands-on math and science that the kids can get excited about and the teachers can feel confident about. I didn't know anything about math and science, but I was excited about this. And I didn't, it turns out, need to know much about math and science for this job, but I really wanted that job. But the job wasn't ready for me. There wasn't a position available. And, you know, I needed a job. I quit my job, the one I didn't belong, where my spirit was flying around. And I thought, well, this isn't good. <laughs> Got to put the spirit back in the body and see, see if I can find something else. And so you know how sometimes it gets worse before it gets better? So I took a job at a place called Media Strategy that was like a newsroom. And if you know me at all, you could probably not picture me working in a newsroom. You know, it's super fast paced, it's kind of aggressive, it's just like, it's so not who I am. I remember my best friend calling me and yelling into the phone, quit your job! <laughs> and I said, shh, because it was one room and the two women who owned the, you know, the place were always in the room, it was like constant surveillance. And I had no idea what I was doing because I turned down the job as an associate and they came back, they wanted me so bad, I have no idea why, and they made me a manager. So I'm managing people who know what they're doing and I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Really, I truly didn't. And so it was day after day, like lead feet, you know, going out of the house, getting in the car, on the train, and shuffling into work and just like, ugh, pit of the stomach. Anybody relate to this? Oh. It's not a fun experience. Thank God they fired me. <laughs> Two months in, it was just like, you know, mea culpa. And I, I was like, me too. Great. I'm free. <laughs> and I called the, the guy that was head of the department of this place, Teachers Academy for Math and Science, where I wanted to work every month. Larry, do you have a job for me yet? 
Larry, do you have a job for me yet? Larry, I really want to work there. And Larry got the message that I was after this job. And, and, you know, in between that time, when I was back at the PR firm, and I really wanted to, to find what was mine to do, I mean, this was way back in the day, I got out the yellow pages, you know? And I went through education organizations in Chicago, and I just started calling people up and finding out what their organization did and, you know, what were some of the options? And I met this amazing man. This is like one of those things that happened on the path, right? When we get really earnest about where do I belong and who, I, who am I and what do I have to give and how can I be fulfilled? You know, these questions, these existential questions that we ask of ourselves, when we get really earnest, the people show up. The resources come that help us, don't they? I mean, this man spent four hours with me. He had never met me before, laying out all the possible paths that I could be a part of this education reform movement in Chicago. And so, you know, it led me to this organization, the Teachers Academy, and then eventually I wore Larry down and he said, fine, I'll hire you. And it turned out to be a fabulous place to work. It was so exciting. It was so dynamic. It was the most diverse place I'd ever worked in. And it was just constant cutting edge kind of rewards of seeing teachers' faces light up, kids' faces light up, and a kind of new infusion of energy into the public schools in Chicago. And, and if you are around pu public schools in big cities, you know sometimes it's not so infused with excitement and enthusiasm, right? So it was really a, a wonderful journey of learning how to take the tough knocks along the way and find a place. And I won't bore you with the next part of that journey. I'll tell you another time. But, <laughs> but you know, it's part of this knowing who we are individually also becomes a knowing of what kind of community we want to be a part of, what kind of families and groups we want to be a part of. The more, again, as Brene says, the self-acceptance rises, the more that true belonging becomes a part of our lives, can be resonant for us. But some interesting things are happening in the world at the same time. And there's some really interesting research out that's sort of a little puzzling, a little puzzling like the quote that we opened with. Bill Bishop wrote a, work, uh, a book called The Big Sort in 2009. And he talks about how we have sorted ourselves. We probably all have noticed this. We keep sorting ourselves into like-minded pockets. We've sorted ourselves geographically politically, ideologically, spiritually. And so we, as we come more and more around like-minded people and shared values and, and people who reflect our beliefs and our feelings and our thoughts, wouldn't you think that'd make us feel more connected? It doesn't. The research is bearing out that we are more disconnected than ever. People are reporting feeling really spiritually disconnected. And they describe in Brene's research that what that means for them is that they don't have a shared sense of humanity anymore. It seems the more we sort ourselves, the more we divide ourselves. And the more we begin to make assumptions about the others, and it fuels the disconnection, it creates a greater chasm. And so this is the kind of world that we are in the midst of. It is further fueled by the fact that we're all living in this kind of giant feedback loop. You know, if we are tuning in to certain radio or, or television or newspapers or blogs that reflect back to us what we already believe and think and feel, we keep validating and sort of getting this sense of righteousness, you know, about what we feel and believe, and then it keeps getting reflected back to us. There was some more research that was done around this called the Arab Spring. Do you remember when the Egyptians over, well, not fully overthrew, but there was great demonstrations to become a democracy and then other Arab nations followed suit? It was an exciting time, the people taking back their power, people creating a, a more democratic society is the way that we would phrase it anyway. And <clears throat> there was research done around after that time where they took groups of liberals, moderates, and conservatives, and they had them all Google Arab Spring. And guess what? Each one came up 
with different information based on their ideology. So if you Googled Arab Spring and you were a liberal, you heard things that matched with your liberal belief systems. And if you were a moderate, sometimes you got different information like vacations or something, you know, in the Middle East. And it, yeah, kind of got lost there in the middle. And then the conservatives, of course, got conservative ideological matches. It's, it's a bit scary, isn't it? That we live in such a world that has been driven so much by this idea of marketing that we have created and don't even recognize sometimes that we're in this constant loop. And so what can we do to get back our connection is step out of the loop. Join a different loop. <laughs> Listen in a different way. Get involved in some other groups that stretch and challenge and allow us to grow and to hear, hear other perspectives. You know, I've shared these kinds of things around my family, but it's important to keep doing this work. When I was home at Christmas, I said to my sister, I really want to sit down and have a conversation because I know we believe so differently and it's been so surprising to me. And I just want to understand. And I want you to understand, you know? So we had a great conversation. I mean, there were times it kind of got off track. <laughs> and then we re recognized what we were doing, speaking from this loop that we've been in, and, and went into a new space to hear each other, to understand each other better, to, to come to that place of reconnection, right? If we can't do that with our own sisters and brothers, how far are we going to get with the people that we don't know, you know? So it's so important to this path of true belonging, actually, that we, we come to these places of actually in different places, go, go into different situations, mix it up a little bit, turns out, is actually the pathway to true belonging. So there's also this other strand that's, that's connected about disconnection, <laughs> and that is this idea of loneliness. In 1980, 20% of Americans reported feeling lonely. Today, it's double that. And it's on the rise internationally. Danae shared with me some, um, and Danae and Don both shared with me some, some new information from um, Britain that they're actually starting a commission on loneliness. I wish they'd call it a commission on connection, but we don't always get to unitize everything the way we want to. <laughs> but it's actually a government department because loneliness has risen so high and people report that they have not spoken to another person for two months at a time. And so they have this commission, this lovely ministry, which is really like a ministry the way we think of it, but it's ministry in their government, that they call people. They get people on the list and they call them and people are getting calls every day. And it's, it's creating that aliveness and that sense of connection and that sense of shared humanity that Cozy so beautifully just sang about, that we all want the same things, you know? Just because we have different ideas about how it happens doesn't mean we don't all want belonging. We don't all want connection and love and peace and joy and kindness and safety for ourselves and our families and our children. I mean, who doesn't want these things? A good education for their kids? It's hard to find anybody who doesn't want those things because we are connected. But the loneliness thing, it's serious. You know, it's actually life-threatening. They say that loneliness and starvation, some of the researchers are putting on a similar, the social scientists anyway, are putting in a similar place, which, boy, it makes you scratch your head a little bit on that one. But when you hear the statistics, these meta-analyses of groups of researchers that have looked at this, they say that early onset of, of dying earlier actually is 5% increase from air pollution, 20% from obesity, 30% if you're excessively drinking, and a whopping 45% if you report that you're lonely. I know, doesn't it just, oh, it just gets me like the depth of my heart every time I think of it or say it. To think about all the people out there who may be homebound and, and not even get outside to connect with a tree let alone to have a conversation with some other people. And so maybe we too need a ministry of connection. <laughs> and we don't have to wait for our government, our federal government to create it because we could be waiting a while. 
<laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> but we can certainly create it, we the people, right, right where we are, wherever we are. We can create these ministries everywhere. Danae was telling me that Napa's mental health program had this exact same kind of program where they would call people. So there's lots of ways we can reach out. I mean, we have so much to offer here. We have prayer chaplains and we have healers and we have people who just are kind and understanding and compassionate. So maybe we'll create a ministry ourselves of connection for our community. If anybody wants to start that up, have at it. We'll support you. <laughs> That's the way it works around here. We want to create something. We need somebody to lead the charge, and then the rest will, will come in. Brene says that part of, part of what this, she phrases the title of the book and, and this process of belonging and becoming, coming into more belonging is a wilderness, the metaphor of the wilderness. You know, what is the wilderness but a place Typically, when we think of the wilderness, we think of going into a place of solitude or we think about being vulnerable, vulnerable to weather, to wild animals or to the unknown, to maybe even strangers that might come through the, the wilderness and we aren't heard. You know, our calls for help wouldn't be heard. You know, but there is also a real aliveness to that. There's a real sense of belonging when we are in the wilderness, a real back to our roots and our soulful connection to all that is. I know I feel most alive when I emerge from a wilderness fast, not usually during it, but afterwards, after I've been well-fed again and <laughs> reconnected with my tribe, then I feel really alive. Or I feel really alive when I plunge into a, a natural body of water that's cool, you know? You know that feeling? It's just like, ah, so refreshing, so alive. What makes you feel alive? I bet everyone in this room would have a different answer. Something that makes you feel so alive when you do it or you experience it. I'll give you a moment just to check in and see, see what's in your heart. What makes me feel most alive? They're great questions to ask because as we unearth the answers, we get a clearer and clearer idea of who we are. And then it's easier and easier for us to understand where we belong, how we belong everywhere, and sometimes it seems nowhere. So you might want to work with that during the week. Journal on this question. What makes me feel alive? I think it will lead us, many of us, it always helps to ask these questions, maybe to renewed understandings or rememberings of old dreams or ideas about yourself that you've always known but maybe have faded into the background a little bit. Brene says that being in the wilderness is actually intentionally putting ourselves in places with people who are different from us. You know, we tried sorting ourselves out and clinging to what's familiar, why not mix it up a little bit now? <laughs> Have you ever been in a place where you're the only person of your race? Yeah, several of you. Yeah. And that feeling, I remember distinctly the first time I had that feeling. Again, I was in my 20s. I was in Rome, and I walked into an African restaurant, and I was the only white face, and I could tell everybody took notice. I mean, there was sort of a forks and knives stopping kind of noticing and a looking to the door, you know? And I had this, that feeling of not being judged, but just feeling really different. And in that moment, just that little moment, I had a little feeling of what it might be like to be a person of color in our country. And to feel different, maybe, a lot when you go places, just because you look different than other people around you, the masses of people that are around you. But you know, I could have read about that experience or I could have watched a movie about that experience or somebody could have tried to teach me it or tell me about it. It wouldn't have been the same as that moment that impressed upon my soul and heart, that moment in time that I can remember viscerally right now, 30 years ago, 
remember what it felt like to feel so different and then to think about how other people feel like this a lot. And had I not had the direct experience, I wouldn't have had the direct moment of compassion and empathy and understanding that unfolded from that. So we can read all we want and we can go to classes and we can watch movies and so on. And that's all enlightening. But it, it ain't nothing like the real experience, you know what I mean? And so it's the real experiences of life. It's getting out of our comfort of our bunkers, as, as Brene talks about, the ideological bunkers that we've created and getting out into places and, and with people who maybe we haven't interacted very much and come with open heart and open ears and open eyes so that we can learn who we really are as a humanity and who we are as an individual. Whether we wander into the literal wilderness or the metaphorical wilderness that Brene Brown is suggesting here, either way, we need one essential, if you will, the one essential that needs to be carried in our backpack is trust. And the element of trust, the elements of trust are broken down in Brene's book along the lines of the word braving. So there's a, a slide up that talks about how we build trust with each other and how we build trust with ourselves is through this mnemonic device, braving, B for boundaries. And boundaries are about respecting other people's boundaries, respecting our own boundaries, asking what the boundaries are, and being willing to say no. One of the ways that we set boundaries, right? And being reliable, being somebody who does what they say they're going to do. And I always add to that, or communicates when it's not going to work out, you know? Because sometimes we can't always do exactly what we promised we said we would do because things change. But at least we can be re a reliable person who clearly communicates the exceptional times when that doesn't work out for us. And the A is for accountability. Accountability is about owning our mistakes, right? Owning up and apologizing when, when we get off, you know, when we make a mistake, basically. And making it okay to make mistakes, really. V is for vault, being a vault of confidentiality, you know? A true confidant. When somebody tells you something, they know they can trust you as a true friend because it's not going anywhere. You're the vault. <laughs> And I is for integrity, and she defines integrity as courage over comfort and really practicing our values. So taking courage sometimes over comfort is a real standing in our truth, integrity. N is for non-judgment. And that non-judgment she describes as feeling our feelings and, and expressing those feelings, not being afraid to and not judging others for the feelings that they bring. So asking for what you need and expressing how you feel and giving others room for, to do the same. And finally, the G is for generosity, which is really just having a generous spirit that gives space for people to make mistakes, that gives people space to line up their intentions, their actions, and their words, and giving kind of a generous interpretation of that. So, and then, of course, we can use the same braving for ourselves, for how we set boundaries, how we're reliable, how we are accountable, and so on. So it's just as a guideline for us to recognize that this element of trust is a really key part of this journey of belonging that may take us into these uncomfortable wilderness kinds of spaces. So finally, Brene says that true belonging is not passive. It doesn't come, as you've probably gathered by now, from just joining a group. It's a practice that requires us to become vulnerable, to allow ourselves to be uncomfortable, and to learn how to be present with people without sacrificing who we are. That's the key. To be present with people without sacrificing any part of who we are. That's a real gift, a real art, isn't it, to learn. She says that true belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. 
You know, that's what the spiritual journey is all about. We say transformation a lot of time, but what we mean by that is shedding what is not me so the true me can rise <laughs> and be known and understood and felt and experienced. So, you know, back to Maya Angelou's quote for a moment where she says, we belong everywhere and we belong nowhere and the price is high and the reward is great. And, and it's freedom. It's our key to freedom, this understanding that we belong both everywhere and nowhere. When we understand this quote spiritually, we understand that we belong everywhere because we are spirit, right? God is everywhere present. And what she means, I think, by we belong nowhere is there are times when we will be standing in the space of feeling alone because we are unique soul expressions. There's nobody like you. Nobody exactly like you. And so when you're truly you, there are going to be times when you feel like, hey, where's my people? <laughs> but then you'll find your people who are also being truly themselves. You know, so the process might feel like the price can be high at times, the things we give up and give over. But stay with us through the series because remember, the reward is great. So we have four more weeks of this series. We're going to be, have one, one week where we skip over because Jacob Lieberman's coming, but we'll pick it back up and end at the end of February. So let's close out with this affirmation. Together, I belong to my God my soul, and all humanity. And so it is. <laughs>